Welcome back. So this is a continuation on our Tandy 425SX video uh, where we talked about the Tandy 425SX. We took it, um, stripped it completely down to nothing and we cleaned and reassembled and made a few changes to the configuration in the process. We actually took out the factory 140 megabyte hard drive and yes, megabyte, you heard me, uh, and replaced it with an upgraded uh, four, was it a 450 megabyte drive? Um, yeah, that, that was an upgrade and it needed it, let me tell you, um, because I intend to load this sucker up uh, with as much as I can. Now, when I bought this machine, I, I, I'll, I'm gonna be completely straight with you guys, I paid $200 cash for this machine, cash, it's like I paid credit, what, what do you, no, I, played, I paid them in pogs. No, uh, 200 bucks, I got the system, the keyboard, the monitor, and this printer. I also received the original system software, which I successfully used to rebuild the system, including the original drivers for the Etherlink 3, the Creative Labs Sound Blaster 16, and the Creative Labs CD-ROM drive, which uses a very unusual driver. It seems like they're very difficult to find, in my experience anyway, I've never been able to find the damn drivers for the freaking things. But I got it all. It's here, it's running, it's happy. I got the original keyboard too. That That is actually, it's a bonus because this keyboard is made by Honeywell. And these were damn fine keyboards in their day. Nice feel to them, very reliable. Um, the printer is a Tandy DMP250 color dot matrix, and that will be the focus of this video. If you haven't noticed, I forgot to plug in the hard drive indicator and power indicator. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it later. Um, but yes, the Tandy DMP250, uh, well, this is a very, very nice printer for its day. Um, I already took it out of the box, clearly. I was gonna do an unboxing, but it, was, it wasn't worth the effort. Um, I was unfortunately missing the driver. Uh, so that is the one thing I don't have is the factory driver installer. Um, however, there is good news. If you happen to find a DMP250, it uses the same driver as a Citizen GSX-140 because Citizen actually made these printers. Um, this is, it looks a little bit different from a GSX-140, but it is essentially the same damn printer. Um, and I'm going to show you some pretty cool stuff that was way ahead of its time. Um, but before we dive into that, let's talk about the color dot matrix printers. What? They were never very popular. Um, I don't recall seeing a lot of them growing up. Now, I was born in 84, so by the time I started, you know, visiting friends and family who owned computers, they never had color printers. They always had a black and white dot matrix. I had a cousin who had a, a um, an Okidata LED black and white laser printer. Uh, but nobody I knew had color printers. None of my classmates had color printers. Now, this is in the early 90s. If they had a printer at all, it was black and white. It was a, it was either a 9 or a 24 pin dot matrix. I'm going to show you the difference between the two. I can't pull the print head out of this one. It's, it's, it's firmly attached. But I can show you the print head from my 9 pin um, Apple Image Writer 2. And a fun fact, the Image Writer 2 is actually manufactured by C. Ito. Uh, it's a Japanese company, um, obviously. And these use a 9-pin printhead. Now, the Image Writer 2 was in production until 1996, and it was only briefly replaced or supplanted with the, um, yeah, the Image Writer LQ. So the Image Writer 2 was a 9-pin printer, and I'm going to show you what this looks like. It's a very simple print head, very robust. What made these printers so so sought after, um, especially in educational environments, is that they were absolutely bulletproof. You could not kill one. Well, there were some that had power supply issues at one point, but you generally you couldn't kill them. They were rock solid. And part of that is their simplicity. Um, this print head, it, being only a nine pin, doesn't generate a ton of heat. See if I can get a good shot of it. 
see, there's only nine pins on that printhead. If you count them, freeze frame, and you should be able to count nine pins. That is what nine pin means. So if you're new to this whole thing, and you've never owned a dot matrix printer before, you're not familiar with them, that is what that is what they're talking about. Nine pins. There are literally nine pins. So these pins fire out. See these little, these, uh, these uh, copper uh, solenoids? It looks like a radial piston engine in a way. There should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are nine of these solenoids arranged in a circle. And those pins are fired from the, probably, I haven't had this exact print head apart before, but I believe they're arranged in a spoke pattern. And an electrical charge is sent to each of these uh, solenoids and it fires that pin. And it only comes out just a little bit, just enough to strike the ribbon, which causes it to contact the paper. This is what they call an impact printer. Um, now, there are other types of impact printers. Uh, one particular type is uh, was rendered almost completely obsolete um, in the early 80s by the dot matrix. Um, and that was the daisy wheel printer. Most of you may never see a daisy wheel printer if you ever have your... You are one of the lucky few if you're, you know, my age or younger. Um, daisy wheel printers were literally um, basically like an IBM, uh, was it the Selectric? Not IBM, but it's, uh, if you've ever used a daisy wheel typewriter, basically the typing elements are arranged in a spoke pattern. So all the, all the characters and fonts. If you have to change the font, you pull the daisy wheel disc out, put another one in. Um, but they're arranged in a spoke pattern. It looks like a wagon wheel with a million spokes. And there's a solenoid that, that uh, strikes whatever typing element is in front of it. So it's got two, um, um, a little servo that spins that wheel to whichever letter is being called for. So letter A, it spins to letter A. And then a solenoid strikes that letter A, hits a film ribbon, and it moves to the next character, A, B, C, D. And uh, those printers were incredibly slow and incredibly loud. However, they had one thing on all printers of the time, even lasers. They had the best print quality money could buy, better than any printer in production. <laughs> they, uh, inkjet, dot matrix, laser, whatever, they were the best print quality. The problem with the daisy wheel printer is it could only print whatever was on that disc. There were no graphics supported whatsoever. Um, if you try to print graphics with the daisy wheel printer, it would just say, what are you doing? It would just print garbage. Um, I actually had one. It was a, it was a Radio Shack, or maybe it was a Tandy uh, daisy wheel printer, made entirely of cast aluminum. That thing was a tank, and boy, was it loud. Well, dot matrix printers were the predominantly affordable printer of the 1980s. The 9-pin models were the most affordable, and if you had an Apple product, that's what you got. Um, they did have, like I said, they had a 24-pin See, they wanted, to re they wanted to come up with a way to increase the print quality out of dot matrix printers, and they came out with a 24-pin printer, which produces graphics that can be, they can rival or almost come close to what a laser printer can do, but not quite, not quite that good, but pretty damn good. I'm going to demonstrate, we're going to do some, some print tests on this thing, and uh, we're going to see what... 24 pin printer can do with an old ribbon. I do need to buy a new ribbon for this. I just Just discovered there's a, actually there's a cut or a slice in the ribbon um, And uh, that's that's not great, but all right Let's get into it. So as I believe I stated earlier this printer was manufactured by citizen and is really just a rebadged citizen um, but uh, the color, oh yeah, the color dot matrix printers, they were kind of an oddity. They were more common, I believe, in, in, in consumer settings. 
with the exception of the Apple Image Writer 2, which they were all color out of the box. You just had to put a color ribbon in them. That was one gratuitous thing Apple did with those printers. See, Apple used to be a great company. They were all about how can we build better products rather than how can we screw the customer. And that's a very biased statement, but if you knew what I go through on a daily basis, you would, you would, you would respect that viewpoint. Um, so the color dot matrix printers, they were, they could come in either nine or 24 pin varieties. Um, Citizen was a big maker of color models. I've seen more Citizen color dot matrix printers outside of the Apple Eco Sphere. sphere. Um, but I've seen them from other companies. I've never seen an Epson color uh, dot matrix. And I've never seen an I've never even seen an HP dot matrix period. I don't think they ever made them. Brother might have made one. Um, I'm not really sure. But all of the ones that I have seen personally have been from Citizen. And the way Citizen uh, set up their printers is they had a ribbon that was it was a, a typical dot matrix ribbon looks like this it's usually carriage width and um generally the ribbon was stationary on the color citizen printers here's what they did and and they made it an option so you didn't have to make this a color printer if you didn't want to um, but this little motor assembly right here it was actually shipped separately or in this case it was included in this compartment here when the printer shipped from the factory. If you wanted to print in color, you could simply add a color printer ribbon and you would install this motor. Um, kind of it, kind of interesting how they did that, but this motor, it just comes right out. You take out one or two screws and the whole thing just comes out. Um, what that motor does is it changes the, the pitch or the angle of the ribbon. So it'll print black, blue, yellow, red, whatever position it needed to be in. And uh, that's that's how it worked. Um, we're gonna demonstrate that right now. The other thing that Citizen did on these printers that was a little bit different, um, and I'm actually kind of blown, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away to an extent about this, but this is ahead of its time. This printer was made in 94. And it has a menu system that is more elaborate than any laser printer that I've ever seen from that time period that had a, a uh, an LCD menu. Um, so basically you've got, there are four menu systems on this printer. There's your macro menu, your setup menu, your quick menu, which is just quick access for color, color setting, pitch, font, etc. And your online menu, which is where the printer will be for most of its life. So they've created this, this little switch here, this function switch that also changes the function and produces a menu for each of these four function keys. Pretty cool. It also has an LCD readout. I mean, it's, it's, it's ahead of its time, honestly. Um, now this printer also features a compartment on the side here, if I can get it off. There we go. And it has a, um, a, a connector for an expansion module. And I believe that is an additional font module. So these were for optional fonts. I'm gonna check the owner's manual real quick and confirm that. Um, it is a 24 pin printer, so the print quality should be pretty awesome for a dot matrix. So let's take a look at some other stuff here. Um, it has a built-in load eject feature for the paper, which a lot of later model, more advanced uh, dot matrix printers had this feature. Let's go ahead and turn it on. So it automatically ejects, the, I think it ejects the paper. No, it didn't eject it. All right, let's go ahead and uh, go to online here, park load. So park, it ejects the paper to the, um, to just before the paper out sensor, so it tells me that the paper is out. Now it's got this cover here. These are usually lost over the years, um, so whenever you find one of these, make sure it has this, this little cover. And you can just pull the paper out this way. 
one thing dot matrix printers never really had, um, although some manufacturers, I think Epson produced one that had a single sheet feeder. Um, most dot matrix printers, if um, I think every one of them was generally tractor feed only. Um, but they did provide a method for uh, feeding one page at a time, and that's what this is for. So you could actually stick this on there, eject the paper from the tractor feed, and you can stick a sheet of paper in this slot, but not multiple sheets, only one at a time. Don't get greedy. But anyway. Um, the other thing that this printer can do is, it, so it supports both push and pull feeding. Um, so the pull feed uh, option, and I don't recall what's, what specifically would require this. I believe it's multi-part forms, to be honest, that require this. But pull feeding is when you take this tractor assembly and you dismount it very carefully because this is very old plastic. So basically you just, uh, Unclip this, push it, I think it gets pushed down or up. There we go. There we go. And then it clips on, um, I gotta, there's an alignment dowel there. There we go. So, what you would then do is you would, you would feed the paper you could feed it either through the bottom. There is actually a slot under the printer. So some printer stands actually had a slot in them right in the middle, like right about here. And you could feed the paper through the bottom. And that, that will be a preferable setup um, for the ultimate uh, go-getter in the 90s. Uh, if you had that, you were, you were pretty much you know, golden. But um, not everybody could afford to have all that technology and consequently not everybody had, you know, that setup. This actually looks a little bit skew here. Is it locked in? It's locked in. It doesn't Oh, it 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 latched onto the wrong uh So that locks into there. That locks into there. Oh, really? This is a pain in the ass. That <laughs> looks in like that. It should go a little further in, no? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it doesn't look it doesn't look right to me. Or it could be the lighting. No, it's definitely not right. <laughs> anyway. <sighs> fun. The fun uh the fun things that you come across when you're working in old junk like this. Is it broken? No, it's not broken. Check this out. So this is spring-loaded. They actually embedded a, uh, a steel spring in there. It's pretty impressive. Anyway. For the most part, though, your dot matrix printers were set up for rear or push feed. And that's what we're going to do here. I actually had a printer back in the day that was top feed only or pull feed only. It was a um, it was an old Commodore printer that someone had given me, and it was actually made by that one was made by Citizen, just like this one. And uh, but it only supported pull feed. I don't know why that was, but all right, let's get this demo sheet off. We're going to go ahead and do a couple of things. But what I want to do now is I'm going to go verify some stuff with the owner's manual. And I want to see what the macro function does and maybe try to demonstrate that. And uh, I've, I've seen macro used in a variety of settings. And it doesn't mean the same thing in every, in every situation. So let's go ahead and load the paper. Now this is a nice feature that this printer has. Um, Again, some older models didn't have this at the time. I'm thinking, you know, the early Epsons that I had back in the day, the FX80 that I had. I had a, um, a Fujitsu DX2400 wide carriage. It didn't have this feature either. But it automatically loads the paper. Because it automatically jams. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, <laughs> now, 
this was, I'm glad this happened because it's a fact of life for, for uh, dot matrix printers is that they do jam up a lot. And um, they were definitely known for it. And that might be why um, so many people dump their dot matrix printers for inkjet models thinking that it wouldn't be a problem anymore. <laughs> Boy, were they wrong. Let's try this again. Yes, it automatically jams for your viewing or for your for your pleasure. Uh, let's try it again. Now, it's all set up correctly, correct? Is that, uh, it's not broken. Right? Nothing's broken. Everything's fine. It's in a fan fold. Now, if you're going to load that, that one page through this feeder here, Oh, you know, I think the paper just got munged. That's all. Well, anyway. If you're going to load that one paper, that one page through, you can do that. Um, all you've got to do is press this forward, and it uh, switches from tractor feed to friction feed. So here we go. Let's try that again. Park. Load. Did it again. Once again, I'm glad this happened. There's something, there's something holding it back. Oh, you know what? I think you have to manually feed it <coughs> up to a certain point. So let's, yeah, I think you do. Yeah, you do. So let's try that. I'm going to just, there we go. Now press it. There we go. All good. Uh, if you're going to use um, the pull feed function, this goes up like that. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm thinking of this cover here. <laughs> this cover goes like that. This lifts up. Okay. So I just read up on what the macro function means on this printer. Um, if you've ever configured an older dot matrix printer, um, for certain features, for example, um, setting the form length, the page skip, um, auto line forward, or line, auto, yeah, line feed, I think it's line feed, carriage return, etc., 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 paper tear. Um, if, you, if you've ever had to do that on an older printer, um, it's typically done with a, either one or two, multiple banks of dip switches. And what the macro feature does is it does it electronically through the menu system. In fact, here are some of the examples of what it offers. So I did suspect that the, um, the cartridge slot in the back was for um, additional font modules. And yeah, I have to look more into that but I do believe that is what it does. And I'm gonna confirm that in just a minute. Here's a photo showing, the or drawing, showing how the bottom feed works. There's a slot at the very bottom of the printer, that's what it's for. A fun, another fun fact, this manual tells you how to clean and lubricate the printer. Um, when was the last time you saw that? I can honestly tell you it's, I've never seen that before. But it tells you how to install the optional color motor. So it, I believe that this printer could have been sold in both black and white or color ready models. Uh, they were all color ready, but this one came with a color motor uh, in the box, and that's uh, that's kind of how that uh, how that is advertised. Um, this is a pretty an exhaustive and technical manual. You just don't get this kind of literature with modern printers. It just I mean, it tells you everything you need to know about care, uh, emulation um, of other printer models, and it's just crazy how exhaustively complete this manual is. You don't get this level of information with anything today, let alone a damn printer. So why don't we do this? I'm going to run a factory test page, and then we're going to try some 
um, high quality printing. Let's see what it can do with the Tandy itself using the uh, Citizen GSX-140 driver. So let's go ahead and put it online. So, oh, before we do that, let's go through these menus. I meant to do that and I forgot to. So, so it, it's all animated and everything. This is really advanced for 1994. You've got to realize the context in which this printer was made. Um, for the most part, most dot matrix printers from that time period, one example would be the Epson ESC Epson LQ570 ESC P2. That's a mouthful. I'm going to repeat it. The Epson LQ570 Plus ESC P2. I actually owned one of those printers, and it was my first 24 pin dot matrix printer for the one or two people who actually care to know that. Um, and it had it had the control panel of a Boeing 747. I mean, it had buttons, more buttons than you can ever count. It was like Button City instead of Spatula City, but with buttons. I mean, it was crazy. However, the, the lovely folks at Citizen figured out a way to do this a little bit better, a little more cleaner, a little less buttons. So, in its upper setting, you've got your, uh, your macro mode. And if I hit select, I can do macro one, demo. Oh, it does a demo page from here too? That's interesting. Look at that emulation. Ribbon, configuration page, help page, demo page, protocol. I didn't know it did that from the macro menu, but I guess it does. Okay, let's go down one more to the setup menu. Oh. Interesting, macro. Looks like it does a lot of... Oh, that's load save. I get it. Okay. Ah, all right. Same menu, but load or save. Macro on 2, 3, 4, 5. I see. Okay. Setup. All right. It has a help menu. What does that do? Help page. It's going to print me a help page. Let's see that help page. Now, I want to also mention how quiet this thing is. It's not even printing on paper. Oh, did I forget to load the paper? So this is what they call draft mode. This is a mode that every dot matrix printer has. Draft mode, and even some inkjets. Draft mode is high speed, low quality printing. Professional printing from the very first page. That's Tandy. So this is draft mode. It's very faint, but it's just in this case, in this setting, the printer is using draft mode to print um, just some boilerplate facts. I think I'll walk you through loading paper again. So let's uh, put the printer off right now. I'm gonna put some paper in the tractor. And there we go. Now, I'm going to get it to this point here. I'll turn the printer on. Okay, we're gonna set it to load paper. Paper empty, park load, load. Okay, paper's where it's gotta go. Now we're gonna go back into that menu and we're gonna look at some other stuff here. Okay. Where were we? Setup menu. Demo page, top set, character set, country, tear off position, paper out, page center. Reverse, line forward, that should load, that should reverse it one step. Its default is off. No, that's not what it is. I should read the, I should read the manual before I start making videos. Um, I thought I knew what I was doing. I guess I don't. Um, where are we? The quick menu, quick, Quick menu, that's your font selection, that's your... So if you're just printing raw data to the printer, you have to select the font within the printer's uh, built-in font directory. And there are only so many of those. And generally with old dot matrix printers, that is what this guy is for. 
Um, so the online menu is your basic print printer on. This is where it's going to typically sit um, because this is where you would turn the printer on or off. Uh, all, um, and you could park or unload and load the paper, uh, line forward, form feed, and um, I don't know what quiet save is. Quiet on, quiet off. We're going to have to check that out. I think quiet is it slows it down. I'm going to turn quiet off and I'm going to go back up one and I'm going to print a demo. Here we go. Take the cover off. You can see how that works. I'm going to look up quiet mode because I'm curious. Let me see if it's in the glossary. Quiet mode, page 13, section 13. Chapter 13. It just says when you want to print with less noise. That's all it says. That's pretty um pretty interesting. I wonder what it I bet it it um it either prints slower or it uses less force on the pen. This is a showing you a sample of each built-in font and what draft mode should look like. how they keep saying it's backed by Tandy's reputation and quality and awesomeness, but it was actually made by Citizen. Um, it's kind of like when you buy a refrigerator today and you've got three manufacturers that are screaming for your attention selling the exact same fridge from the same OEM. Uh, it's just kind of the world we live in, I guess. So for our next demo, I'm going to put the printer online. TOF. I've never seen that before, but it is online, so that's good. I'm going to put quiet mode on, and then we're going to put it off. Or turn it off and see if, see what the difference is. Alright, I'm going to, my battery's dying, so I'm going to quickly design something. And we're going to print it in high quality mode, in both quiet mode and normal mode, and see what, see what happens. But in order to do what we want to do, we need to actually install some software. It turns out, I, I do have Microsoft Works on here. I've got the original copy that came with the machine from the factory, believe it or not. But what I don't have is Microsoft Office 6.0. All right, let's see what we got here. Word perfect, word perfect. 11, this 10. Okay, that's all word perfect. Word 6 for Windows. Ah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Got it. Let's put it on. So we just confirmed that that CD-ROM drive will, will read um, modern day uh, burnt CDs. 
so that's that is something. So I should be able to install this from a floppy disk. All right, set up that exe. There we go. So I'm going to go ahead and install Word 6.0, and we're going to play with some clip art, see how that looks, and um, print some high quality materials. I think there are some sample letters built in that we can we can play with. This is going to be fun. So. I mentioned this in a previous video that was actually the subject was the same exact model computer. Believe it or not, this is my second 425SX. I've had two of them now. And the first one was actually trash picked in 2000, probably 2012 or 2011. It was a while ago. And um, yeah, it was a trash picked machine. And um, <clears throat> I got excited because it was as close as I'm going to get to the first computer I ever surfed the web on at home. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat that story that I told when I had the first 425. So for the record, my first um, internet-abled computer was a circa 1994, same age as this. It was a Tandy 3100. Uh, like this machine, it was built by AST, but it was not as high quality of a machine. It, it had almost the same logic board, but it had a plastic case. Um, the, the case cover was plastic with metal shielding inside. It's almost like it was a later revision of this case, but otherwise it was relatively identical. Um, and and spec-wise, too. Same specs, same size. It was basically the same machine. If I recall, though, the, four, um, the 3100 only had one uh, five and a quarter inch bay. That was the difference. The, the 3100 had just one bay, and that was it. And there was nothing under it. So you couldn't put a three and a half inch hard drive underneath. That's how I remember the machine. I, I could be wrong. So, <clears throat> let me tell you how, it, how I came across it. So, my dad, he worked in the um, corporate security business. Or uh, commercial security business. Um, his company serviced and installed um, security systems. They also had a um, a rent a, a rent a cop division as well. I almost said rent a pig, but that's disrespectful. Um, they had a rent a cop division too. My dad's job was to install and service security systems, and um, so <clears throat> in May of 1997. He, uh, or it might have been 96. No, it was 97. I know that for a fact. He uh, was doing a, um, a computer replacement. Up they were upgrading a system in a building that was, um, I believe it was owned by a company called Corporate Software. And they were a big, con you know, one of those conglomerate software companies. They they had owned a couple of different smaller companies. It was, it was a whole big thing. It was the 90s. Tech companies were sprouting up left and right. So he replaced the, the, the computer system and he asked if he could take it home because he knew I loved computers and you know it was actually not that old. It was only three years old at the time. And um, so he brought it home and you know, gave it to me, and I was like, I was, ex I was super excited because the computer that I had at the time was a 386 Toshiba T3200SX, which was what you call a portable desktop. It had a plasma display. It weighed about 40 pounds, and it was not a laptop in the true sense. It was a portable desktop. That was how they marketed that machine. We had no internet access at home. And that machine, although lightly capable of it, um, it wasn't something I would have done in, in all seriousness. So my dad, um, he gave me the machine and said, here, have fun. And I, <clears throat> I set 
set up to, excuse me, I set out to rebuild it. I put a clean copy of Windows 3.1 on it. Now, Windows 95 was still relatively new in 1997. Well, it wasn't new, but it was, it was only two years old. Um, but I didn't want to put it on this, on this 486 because I didn't have a license for it or anything. I didn't have a copy available to me. But, um, so I rebuilt the machine. I, um, I had installed a 16-bit, uh, sound card into it. It was a Voyatra or some other, what, what brand was it? It was, um, it was, a, I forget the brand. It was an off-brand card, though. Um, but it came with Voyager software, I know that. So I had sound. It actually had a Media Vision uh, sound card and CD-ROM drive uh, installed. And the reason I couldn't, so I couldn't use any of that because I had no software. And this was before we had the internet, so think about that for a sec. I had no way of getting it running again. All the software was missing. So I, um, <clears throat> I decided because so the Media Vision sound uh, sound card and CD drive were packaged, bundled in the same way that the Creative Labs uh, drives and cards are bundled. So the drive actually ran off of the sound card. So it was my my birthday was coming up, and I asked my parents. I said, look. <clears throat> folks, um, the internet's, you know, kind of taken off, and I, I'd really like to have access to it, and, and uh, I know my, my mom was, my mom would actually visit her friends who had internet access just to use it, and um, so I was like, look, we can make this happen, but I said, I'm going to need some parts. I mean, this machine didn't have a modem, um, and I wanted to replace the, the Media Vision CD drive with something more modern. And uh, so my parents agreed. It was my birthday, so they were like, all right, we'll, we will fund this venture for you. So we drove over to Computer City. Computer City. And uh, they actually had um, everything I needed, of course. It was Computer City was actually owned by Radio Shack. And Computer City, ironically, is where the computer would have come from. Possibly, or it could have come from a Radio Shack store. This Tandy, for example, this machine likely came from a Radio Shack store. Um, but Computer City was Radio Shack's um, answer to CompUSA. And... If you're familiar with Nashua, New Hampshire at all, if I'm not mistaken, Computer City is, or was, where the current day Best Buy location is, right next to a Circuit City, to make it even more confusing. And Circuit City was not related to, or connected to, Computer City in any way. Um, the, this particular division of Radio Shack did not last very long. In fact, I believe that store shut down within a year of us going there. So. When I went to Computer City, <clears throat> here's what I ended up getting. A brand new Memorex 24X CD-ROM drive. I got a Newcom 33.6 modem. And I got a set of uh, LabTech battery-powered computer speakers. And uh, that, was, that was what I got for my, that would have been my 13th birthday. Yeah, my 13th birthday. May of 1997. So, <clears throat> moving along. We got all the stuff home. I had this machine, uh, I, w within five minutes I had everything installed. And um, got the drivers installed. So back in the day, AOL used to, AOL, America Online was the one of the more popular just through market saturation um, but one of the more popular consumer internet service providers AOL still exists as a matter of fact even my AOL email address still exists more on that later maybe maybe not so AOL would send floppy disks to basically every US address at least in the US they would send floppy disks in a blanket marketing campaign 
with free software. Well, the free software was AOL itself, and there were no games or anything. The deal was you got you got you got the software for free, and you would just um, and it, and this is the thing. Each disc came with um, a number of hours of, of online time. There was a time when, um, when internet services were sold by the hour, kind of like a lady of the night. Um, you would pay by the hour. And uh, around this time, around 1997, is when AOL was really pushing their unlimited access. In addition to, they were pushing their... Um, AOL 3.0 software, which was the first version of America Online to include access to the World Wide Web. So, fortunately for me, I had an AOL 3.0 disc, and I was able to install it. Now, my aunt was the one who helped my mom with all the billing stuff and walked her through how that works, and... Um, you know, and that was that was nice of her to do that. So I remember now. We all have memories in our lives, like like certain moments that we'll never forget, um, unless we get Alzheimer's or hit by a bus or something. In my case, that moment in my life was probably the most pivotal because it unleashed access to information that I could not comprehend the amount of information. I remember, so after that night, after we got the, the damn thing set up, we had an account created. Oh, real quick, I meant to, I, I, I kind of steered off from this, but the AOL discs included um, a number of hours of online access time for each user, or for each uh, household. The caveat was, it was free if you signed up. So you had to sign up and, and give them your, your billing information before you would have access to the free time. The free time, I, I, I could never quite figure out how that worked because I never once, because I actually helped set up a dozen people or more with America Online over the years, um, back when it was still cool. And uh, what are you looking at me for? Okay, cat. So I set up more, about a dozen families um, and individuals with internet access using AOL because it was the easiest thing to use. Um, and the people that I helped set up were not tech savvy, never will be, never were. Um, <clears throat> so you got to keep that in, in, in mind. You know, really though, if you were not tech savvy, America Online was actually a good thing because it protected you from yourself and it was easy to use. And if you're the only guy in the neighborhood who knows how to use a freaking computer, your phone will ring off the hook if you set it, if you had set them up with something else like Earthlink or Prod no, Prodigy, Earthlink, um, or any of the other smaller um, dial-up carriers, ISPs. I mean, um, but AOL was the I call it the Internet on training wheels, and that's what it was, and it was good at that. It was. It was great. It was. It was. You know, a lot of people trash AOL for good reasons, um, but you can't deny that AOL was good at one thing, and that was making the internet simple for people who were not tech savvy, like my grandmother, for example. But um, and in 1997, my family wasn't tech savvy, and neither was I. I had very minimal access to computers at the time. And what little I knew, I learned on my own, really. And, um, and it was just, uh, but anyway, moving along. My battery's got 10 minutes left or less. I gotta get a new battery for this camera. It's, it's pretty pitiful. It's, it's just junk. I, I have two batteries and they both suck. So, anyway. But we pretty much covered the basics. Um, but getting back to that one moment in my life where I just sort of, it was like I woke up again, I was born again. It was the strangest, it was the strangest feeling, really, for a kid. Um, suddenly, like, a moment prior to, to, to this one May weekend in 1997, 
Uh, if I wanted to know anything, if I wanted to look something up, I had to drive or ride my bicycle four miles one way to the town library or do it at school. But if it was the summer and I'm bored and I want to look something up, I want to know something about something, I would have to get on my bike and I would have to ride to the town library four miles away. And and that was, um, that was fine and all. But all of a sudden, at the drop of a hat, like that, I had access to the world, and and I remember that there that that very that very moment. I sat at my desk. Every the fan, you know, everybody had gone home. Like my aunt went home, my cousins went home. My parents were probably in bed by that point. My sister was already sound asleep, and I'm sitting in my bedroom with this Tandy 486 PC in front of me with internet access, and I'm like. It's like it's like when a teenager gets the keys to the family station wagon for the first time. And it was the most incredible feeling I ever had. And and I it, it I just remember sitting there just dumbfounded. And I repeated this to myself. I have the world at my fingertips. I mean, I really did. It, it was 1997. The internet wasn't as built out as it is today, and it was much simpler, and um, a lot less. It was it was sleazy for sure. But um, what do you think a 13-year-old kid looked up for the very first time when they had access to all the information the world had published to the internet up to that point? What do you think I did the first freaking time? The very first minute I had access to the internet by myself. No, it's not what you're thinking. I was... <laughs> I actually forget... No, I didn't look up porn. Um, I, I didn't. Not... No, I really didn't. Um, what the hell was I looking for? I do not remember. I think I was looking for... Um, hell, I couldn't tell you. Because I don't remember what it was that I looked... What my first search was. So the, ser the search engine that I used for the first time was called AOL NetFind. It was built right into the AOL web browser, and um, yeah, 6.0, Microsoft Word 6.0. This is before Clippy. Clippy didn't exist back then. Now let's type out, let's see if there's any sample documents. I think there are, and that will save us a little bit of time. Letters. Nothing there. I could have sworn there were there were uh, demos. Uh, I guess the hell not. Oh, here we go. Here's some samples. Lorem Ipsum, I bet. It's uh, probably. Uh, here we go. This month, 90 degree. It's got a color graphic in it. It's got a lot of text. All right, that'll have to do. It's got, it's a good test page. What do you think? The printer turned on? Yeah. Let's print it out. Let's do a preview first. Okay. Let's print it. Oh, crap. That's not what I wanted to do. Well, let's, let's just see what it does. The print quality is dismal because that, that ribbon is trash. So we're going to have to um, order up some ribbons. I may not be able to find a color ribbon, though. That's the upsetting thing. But... I think I figured out what quiet mode does. In quiet mode, it only prints in one direction. In normal mode, it actually prints in both directions. Let's let's give that a try. I'm gonna swap the battery out in the camera first. All right. So I think we figured out what that mode does. Um, now, it seems to be the top of form. Let's see. Let's turn off quiet mode. It says TOF, top of form.
So we're gonna unload it. Here, let's go a little bit further. Yeah, that the print quality is, is really bad. This ribbon is toast. Um, So we turn quiet mode off. I'm just gonna load it. Okay, online. Comes up and says TOF. Um, well, let's just see what that does. So I'm gonna print the same thing out, but I'm gonna print it in high quality mode by going into print um, right up in here. Let's take a look at that menu and see what we can get. Options. Is there a print quality option? Yeah, that's fine. Here we go. Ah, dithering. Fine dithering. Letter quality. So it is in letter quality. It is in color. I'm going to set it to be a little bit darker. So here we go. I guess it does print in both directions. I mean, I mean that's yeah, the fun thing. Okay. But it is hammering those pins a little louder. Let me get the cover on this thing. It's too loud. Too bad. You put the cover on, it dampens it out pretty nicely. Anyway. So, what I did notice, if I can find the previous printout. Um, by changing it to quiet mode, I mean uh, normal mode, it, uh, it darkened it a little bit, um, but I also set the, um, the printout to be slightly darker on the control panel, so I'm not sure which. I should have done them independently, but there's a lot of banding here. Now, banding on a color dot matrix is pretty much a matter of normalcy, um, but with an aged out ribbon like this, it's even worse. Um, And that ribbon is dried out um, pretty badly, so we're definitely going to have to start looking at ribbons. Um, I, I know I can find a color ribbon for this. I'm pretty sure I can find one. I should be a little more uh, honest with myself. But I know I can get a black ribbon. I'll get one of those too. You don't always have to burn up your colors. Color ribbons don't last. That was probably one of the biggest complaints of the dot matrix printer color models. Regardless of who the manufacturer was, the color ribbons had a couple of things against them. You couldn't re-ink them with an at-home re-inking kit, and they didn't last. They just plain didn't last. Um, they would dry out rapidly. Um, because the ribbon, let me show you what I mean here, I'll get a visual aid. I'll use the, uh, I'll use this printer as a visual aid. But if you look at the ribbon on the color printer, um, there's four colors and they're, and they're very thin. The, the ribbon of the, each color ribbon is extremely thin. And consequently, they don't hold as much ink. So, especially the black ribbon. So, if you're printing a lot of black text, you would not want this ribbon in the printer because it's going to burn up your black in no time. And that is the biggest problem with these ribbons. The other thing is, they can't be re-inked. Um, a black ribbon, which holds a ton of ink, because it's about the same width, um, and the entire width of the ribbon is containing uh, contains liquid ink. 
the um, that has been impregnated into the fabric. But with those black ribbons, you could get an at-home reinking kit, and you can simply refill them. Um, but you can't do that with a color ribbon. The color ribbons are also very expensive compared to the black ribbons. So, they, again, they weren't very popular. Um, I think a lot of people bought color printers, and they just bought black ribbons for them because it was just too costly to keep having to replace the, the color ribbon. I'm installing SimCity, uh, because why not? Um, <laughs> let's see how well it runs. The 46 DX266, that's what we have for a processor. It's in the package of an overdrive chip. Uh, but that's basically what it is. And um, I remember playing SimCity on mine with a 486 D uh, at the, the factory 25 megahertz SX chip, and it was pretty bad. But once I put it, you see that machine that I told you about, I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta elaborate on that a little bit. The Tandy 3100 that I went on the internet with, and I had that moment of utter joy um, when I realized that I could access any information I wanted on anything for 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 basically nothing um, in my bedroom, it, it was just it was I was eye awakening, eye awakening, eye, it was eye opening, <laughs> it was eye awakening too. Um, but that moment was quickly squashed when I realized the limitate. Oh, I'm not running in 256. But I was. I guess I'm not. I'll have to fix that. Um, oh yeah, that's gonna look bad. So we gotta fix our, our color settings. It's Apparently it's not in 256 color mode. So as I was saying, I had that moment of joy when I realized that really anything was possible. But as soon as I logged into the internet, my mom picked up the phone to call her friend, and I was immediately disconnected. And that was pretty much the way it went for the entire time I had the internet. Um, yeah, it was it was like, all right, whatever. Um, you know, that sucked. Let's see. 640 by 480, 256 color. Yeah, let's, let's do that. But yeah, you know, well, I just looked at the clock. It is now one o'clock in the morning and um, I need to go to bed. So thank you for watching. Um, so yes, dot matrix printers were great for cheap printing, but color printing was just, um, it was not great. Um, and that was the topic. That was, that was what this video was supposed to be all about, but I kind of rambled on. As I always do. But I did want to talk a little bit about my childhood experience with the very first internet capable machine I ever had. And it was almost identical to this one. And it was an experience that I will never forget. Um, you know, everybody has those moments in life when they, 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 they reach a, a turning point. Now, for me, um, one of the first things I actually looked for on, um, on the internet was vintage computer stuff. And to be honest with you, I found the vintage computer, um, uh, what was it? Tom Carlson's Obsolete Computer Museum uh, was one of the first vintage computer collector forms, I believe. And that was one of the first websites I kind of made a regular. Um, and I started joining the online forum on his website, which was, uh, this is, this kind of shows what kind of internet we had back then, or the, the kind of people that were around back then. Um, it was, uh, it was a different experience. Um, we had this online forum that was no registration needed. Anyone could post anything and it was not moderated. Um, and it was pretty well governed. Um, pretty well controlled. 
You get a few flare-ups, uh, just random trolls would show up, but that particular online forum was, it was one of the only ones of its kind. It was an open and free discussion group um, amongst collectors and people who were just curious in general. And I was a regular there from like 1998 on to like well into the mid 2000s when the forum was finally shut down. It was a different time. It was a different, different time. That's for sure. Let's see if this monitor can handle eight. I'm, I'm dying to know if this monitor can handle 800 by 600. We're gonna find out right now. If it doesn't work, ooh, it, it, it'll do it. It'll do it, it'll do it, it'll do it. Oh my God, it actually did it. I'm blown away. And it looks like it's in 256 color mode. Let's take a look. Um, where are we? I'm in the wrong control panel. Oh, 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 I got dots everywhere. Oh crap. Yeah, that, that, I, there's a problem with that card. For sure. Um, it, I'm thinking, I'm thinking bad video RAM. And one way to tell is, what, what I can do is I can start pulling those RAM chips out one at a time until this clears up. Although I'm not sure if it'll run with one of them. That's actually 16 color mode. Let's try for a 256-512K. Uh, please insert the OEM driver disk. I have that. I actually have that. Yeah, pull it. Where, where did I put that disk file? It was in a separate one. Uh, I don't know where I put it. Oh, here it is. So we're going to try. I promise this will be the end of the video. If you're still watching at this point, good on you. So this is the the Tandy Omni Profile um, PC. That's what they called it. So just in case you were wondering, it definitely has upgraded video RAM. Um, the entire video RAM bank is completely populated. Um, I don't have a display driver disc. I don't know why it's asking for that. Um, I don't have a driver for that. So, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Current. Restart Windows. All right. Let's see what this does. This will, this will either crash and burn, or it'll... Well, there's a few different... There's a few different ways that this could... Wow, that looks nice. And we got Dot City, my friends. There's all kinds of crap everywhere. Oh my god. Yeah, it, it, it follows the window. So, the, the, well, not only, so it does support 800 by 600, and it looks pretty fine, but um, we've got a lot of artifacts here. You can, you can see it, can't you? Let me show you. You can't see it. All right, here we go. See that? Oh man. Crazy. Yeah, we've got some bad VRAM. So what I gotta do is I'm gonna pop the VRAM chips out one at a time, maybe, until we figure out which one's doing this. Because it's, it's more than likely there's there's probably just one bad module, and I should be able to find those if I if I pray and hope that uh, there is a God after all. Now, one way we can eliminate that. Yeah, that's pretty bad. I'm sorry. That's that's just terrible. But it's too late for the for me to mess with this right now. I'm I gotta go to bed. Uh, so you guys, uh, peace out.